you need people who are passionate about this and people who are obsessed with this kind of stuff. And, you know, that's, that's where I'm at right now. I'm passionate and obsessed about this stuff. Welcome to the Rebel Health Coach Podcast with Tom Underwood. Armed with truth and knowledge, your journey to a healthy lifestyle can be obtained. Preventative wellness, quality nourishment, and daily fitness routines dramatically improve your outlook on life as a whole. And you'll find the support and info you need to accomplish a healthier lifestyle here. Together, we can empower each other along our journey to an amazing you. Today on the Rebel Health Coach Podcast, I have Dr. Esposito. Dr. Esposito is a naturopathic physician, a licensed acupuncturist, and a functional medicine practitioner specializing in integrative urology and men's health. Dr. Esposito, welcome to the show today. Thanks for having me, Tom. I I appreciate being here. And today we're going to go into prostate health for men, because this is a topic that really needs to be addressed. Yeah, absolutely. I agree. Not enough people are talking about it. And, you know, as we spoke before, men, they just, they want to ignore it. So I won't let that happen. All right. Good. I, I'm right. I'm, I'm on the same boat as you. I'm, it's it's two prostate cancer, colon cancer, uh, testicular cancer are all in the, in you know, something that's driven by a lot of things, but we're going to get into that. Tell us a little bit about yourself and and where you practice. I know you're specialized in men. So tell us a little bit about your practice so we can acquaint the listeners with who you are and where you came from. Sure. So I'm a naturopathic physician. I'm a licensed acupuncturist, a functional medicine practitioner. I practice in in Connecticut at the Center of Excellence. And then I also uh, teach at New York University. So I'm a professor, adjunct professor at New York University. I'm a magic professor at University of Bridgeport College of Naturopathic Medicine, and um, I also conduct research out of NYU uh, Urology. So I got started into men's health. Uh, I would say it was my my third year in undergrad, and I started reaching out to uh, naturopathic physicians. And I knew I wanted to be a naturopath since I was 17, and I really didn't know I wanted to do men's health, but I knew I wanted to do hormonal health. So I started reaching out to uh, urologists all over, and and I came across uh, one naturopathic physician. His name is Dr. Espinoza. After meeting with him, he basically kind of took me under his wing and said, "Hey, we're going to work together, and I'm going to help you and teach you a lot of the things that I want that you might want to learn." So what ended up happening is that we started conducting research. So we started publishing papers and working on chapters, and I started learning a tremendous amount. And then I realized a little bit about myself. I, if I want to learn something, I'm completely obsessed over it. So I like, I don't do a little bit of men's health. I don't do a little bit of prostate cancer. I don't do a little, it's all or nothing. And I just, I drown myself in the information. And it just so happened that men's health was the, the avenue that I wanted to take. And it's also a great area because I'm a guy and um, I know how guys think. And I grew up an athlete. So I know how some men have that like jock or macho type of attitude. And I could, you know, I can relate to that. And, but I also, um, have other aspects of me that's not so macho and very self-aware. So, uh, and then I just started, you know, seeing a lot of male patients. I was like, wow, this is a really great population to treat. The reason why is because when you have a male patient, if you tell them, you know, jump up, up and down three times and spin around and do 10 jumping jacks, they'll do it. But you just have to tell them exactly what to do. You can't just say, like, go exercise because they don't get that. So I, I just found that was a really good population that I connected with. That's awesome. And today's topic is about prostate health. It's pretty devastating, the statistics in prostate health. One in seven men will be diagnosed with prostate cancer. That's a lot. Yeah, that's right. So let's talk about this gland. Where is the prostate located? So the prostate is, um, so most urologists will find it by doing a rectal exam, but the prostate sits in the perineum, which is basically your pelvic area underneath the bladder and it's um, anterior to the rectum. So when you get a prostate exam, oftentimes your 
urologist or your primary care will try to feel your prostate going through your anus and then feeling the prostate through the rectum. He's not feeling your actual prostate, but he's feeling it through the rectum. So he's not actually touching it directly, but he's getting um, a feel of it. But it's, it's directly sitting below the bladder. And then there's a urethra, which is how you carry urine from your bladder which passes through the prostate and then out through the penis. And then that's how you, that's how you urinate. So it's in the pelvic area. Okay. What is the prostate? So the prostate is a gland that um, is only found in men and it has many different purposes. It's uh, responsible for, um, for reproductive health. So it, it releases some prostatic fluid, which helps make sure sperm are very healthy. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a gland. So it, it secretes certain secretions to allow for proper uh, urethral health and then also sperm health. Okay. Okay. Now, how do we find out this gland is not functioning properly? As a man, like what, doing our normal day stuff, how do we know this isn't working right? There's many different types of prostate conditions. So there's there's BPH, which is um, enlarged prostate, uh, also known as benign prostatic hyperplasia. Then there's prostatitis, which is pain of the prostate. And there's several different kinds. Um, most kinds are um, either acute or chronic. So basically, one is caused by an infection. And then chronic is there's no known infection. They can't really identify if there's a bacteria that's causing the pain. So prostatitis is inflammation of the prostate. Then there's uh, prostate uh, cancer. So each one has a different set of symptoms. If you have an enlarged prostate, you're probably going to have difficulty with urinating, waking up at night to urinate. When you do urinate, there's a little bit of hesitancy. So uh, it's hard to, like you're standing at the urinal or at the toilet and trying to urinate and it won't come out. Uh, prostatitis is you're going to feel that. I mean, you can't, uh, you're, you're not going to miss that. That's going to be painful. You're going to feel pain in your pelvic area. Sometimes it can radiate to the testicles, to the anus, to the penis, uh, to the bladder, to the, to the, even just like your pubic area. And then prostate cancer oftentimes is, uh, asymptomatic. So a lot of times there's no symptom of prostate cancer, but if there is going to be a symptom, it's definitely going to be either you know difficulty urinating if there's a if there's a tumor that's pressing on the urethra but oftentimes you can't really feel prostate cancer so usually men will get will get a PSA done it's a PSA is a type of antigen that the prostate releases however there is some research showing that other uh, glands uh, other body parts can release it as well but mostly it's from the prostate so Usually men over the age of 50 will get their PSA done. If they have a history of prostate cancer, like a family history, then they'll get it tested earlier. So it's really hard to say if somebody has prostate cancer or not. And it, even PSA is not very accurate. Okay. So what are some of the root causes of prostate health issues? Okay. That's a very broad type of uh, answer. Right. It could be anything from so prostate. So prostate cancer is largely a lifestyle cancer, which basically means that uh, there's many lifestyle factors that contribute to prostate cancer, but also there's many lifestyle factors that can prevent prostate cancer. So I'll take, for example, uh, smoking, obesity, lack of exercise, uh, eating foods that are carcinogenic, like grilled meats, blackened meats. Those are things that will contribute to uh, prostate cancer. Now, exercising, eating a specific type of diet, uh, having enough sleep, having healthy hormonal levels, those are all things that help prevent prostate cancer. Now, the, a lot of people think that if they have an enlarged prostate, that they're going to get prostate cancer, but actually the two are not related. So most men who are concerned, there's like, oh my God, I have an enlarged prostate. That means I'm going to get prostate cancer. That's not true. But you can have both. You can have an enlarged prostate and get prostate cancer. But just because you have an enlarged prostate doesn't mean you'll get prostate cancer. So there's a lot of different factors. And then prostatitis, prostate pain can be caused from chronic inflammation. It can be caused from an infection that really never really went away. There's, there's many different factors when it comes to that. Okay. How, where does testosterone, low testosterone, as we age, we, our testosterone levels decrease? A lot of things happen. Does low testosterone play a part in prostate health? 
Yeah, absolutely. So there is this misconception that testosterone causes prostate cancer. And this occurred around the 50s where this uh, this scientist, he did some research on dogs and found that when you gave, uh, when you castrated these animals, their, the test, the, their risk of prostate cancer went away. And then when you gave them more testosterone, that the prostate cancer got worse. But actually, that's, that's not true, or the research is showing that may, that may not be true. One of the main researchers in this field is Dr. Abraham Morgenteller. He's at Harvard. And he found, uh, he's, he's theorized this, this idea of something called the testosterone saturation model, which basically says testosterone can contribute to prostate cancer, but only to a certain extent. So when testosterone levels get way over a, a certain number, they're not going to contribute to more testosterone, uh, to more prostate cancer. So for example, men who have prostate cancer, they take away, they do one of the treatments is uh, ADT, which is androgen deprivation therapy. Basically, they deprive you of all of your testosterone. And the, your PSA drops and your, your testicles shrink and your prostate gets smaller and it helps prolong life in people who have metastatic prostate cancer. So they thought, okay, well, if we get rid of all the testosterone and the prostate cancer kind of goes into remission or slows down, then that must mean more, pro- more testosterone makes it worse. But actually, that's not true. And we found that above 200 to 250, I believe, nanograms uh, per uh, nanomole of testosterone uh, does not make prostate cancer worse. So that's, that's, that's a really big misconception. And in fact, healthy testosterone levels throughout life Make the uh, have shown to be protective against prostate cancer, ag- aggressive prostate cancer. So testosterone actually is very protective, but there is some thought that testosterone, uh, the byproduct DHT, which is dihydrotestosterone, can actually make uh, enlarged prostate worse. So um, that that certainly is definitely an issue. Okay, yeah, that's so why I was going to go on to DHT there, but <clears throat> I know that we live in a society today that many people are estrogen dominant and insulin resistance is high. High glycemic diets are all over the chart. Right. And that has to play an effect, on, not just on the cancer, but on the prostate health. The high estrogen levels or yes. the, the diet? Yeah. The, the diet and the estrogen dominance. Yeah, so absolutely. So the, the thing is, is that prostate uh, cancer actually can be worsened by estrogen. Now, there's two different types of estrogen receptors. There's estrogen receptor alpha and estrogen receptor beta. Beta is protective, and alpha is, we call it proliferative. So it actually can cause prostate cancer cells to grow more. Now, that means that if you have high estrogen levels, it can activate the alpha and cause prostate cancer to get worse. And we do see that clinically, that usually high estrogen levels can can make prostate cancer worse. But well, how does that relate to the diet? Well, a high glycemic diet, a, a diet high in sugar, actually increases the activity of an enzyme called aromatase. And aromatase is the enzyme that converts testosterone to estrogen. Now, if you have more conversion of testosterone to estrogen from increased aromatase, right, and you're eating a lot of sugar, which then increases that activity, then you're going to have more estrogen levels, which is which is caused by a high sugar, high glycemic diet, which then can contribute to more prostate cancer. But it's not just estrogen. There's different factors at play. So there's also um, the estrogen byproducts. So, so there's a 2, 4, and 16 hydroxy series of estrogen. The 2 is protective. The 4 and the 16 are are uh, detrimental, so they cause more damage. What I would say is we want to increase the two and prevent any four and sixteen. There's a lot of molecular, you know, pathways to go down that route. You really have to look at COMT and and cytochrome uh, enzymes. But bottom line is, um, you really don't want to have too much estrogen because that can contribute to prostate issues. Also. Men should not be having high levels of estrogen because we're more testosterone dominant, and that's just how we're made. Okay, progesterone levels. Where do they play into and into play? And, and so, in, in men's health, you know, progesterone is a uh, it's oftentimes considered a female uh, hormone, right? And the research, really, I haven't 
uh, seen a lot of evidence on whether progesterone is good or bad. But progesterone can have other metabolites as well. And it's derived from the same thing as testosterone and estrogen. So they're all derived from uh, pregnenolone. Okay. I, I don't test pregn- uh, progesterone levels in, in men just because I don't know what to do with that information. The research, uh, from what I've seen so far, really doesn't tell me, okay, if this guy has high progesterone levels, that it increases his risk or decreases his risk. It okay. really doesn't do a lot for me, but it does tell me where the pathways may be going. So perhaps his metabolic pathways are pushing it towards progesterone and I want to get it towards or or away from that and away from estrogen and and towards testosterone. So it gives me an idea of how to manipulate the pathway and and get a little bit of a clue as to where things are going. But I, you know, if some if you tell me this guy has high progesterone levels, I really would just say, okay, what else? Okay. Let's go through each of these. Enlarged prostate, we covered a lot of this. Yeah. But I think, what is the most common of these three? So uh, BPH is probably going to be the most common. I, I can't say the exact statistics, but of compared to like which one's more common, prostate uh, cancer or BPH or what type of, what type of prostatitis, what I would say is uh, usually the statistics go is about 50% of men at the age of 50 have an enlarged prostate, 60% at 60 years old have an enlarged prostate, 70% at So the older you get, the more likely it is that a man's going to have an enlarged prostate. Most men have an enlarged prostate but by the time they're 60 or, or 50 uh, or 70. But also, most men um, will have some type of prostate cancer in their prostate as they age. But that's, that's like saying well, most men will have you know, freckles or most men will have uh, cavities by the time they're a certain age. It just so happens that as the prostate ages, it does tend to have more uh, susceptibility to being a cancerous or, or malignant. But now we have to define, well, most men will die with prostate cancer. They will die with prostate cancer, not from prostate cancer, which is a big deal because you know, getting the diagnosis of, a, of, of having prostate cancer really is, it can be you know, a shock to some men. They're like, oh my God, I have prostate cancer. My life is over. But the fact is that most men will die with it rather than from it. So how do we figure out, you know, my goal is not to find out who has prostate cancer, is to how do I identify the prostate cancer that will kill people? How do I identify the aggressive prostate cancer? That's what I really want to find out. And so I can't say how many men have a non-aggressive prostate cancer at a certain age because most of the time they're not checking. Right? If your PSA is low enough uh, or a biopsy comes back negative, then you really don't know, but you're not checking the whole prostate gland. But BPH is certainly more common in older men. By the way, most of these things are, uh, are conditions of older men, except prostatitis. I see prostatitis impacting men at a much younger age. I mean, I've seen prostatitis at, at as early as uh, you know, 18 to 20 years old. So that's more of a younger condition compared to the BPH, which is more older. The good thing is, is that a lot of these things are treatable and a lot of them are, are manageable. And um, I'm very comfortable in treating them and managing them. To sign up for my monthly newsletter, text RHCP, that's Rebel Health Coach Podcast, or Red Hot Chili Peppers, to 22828. Again, that's RHCP to 22828. Thank you and have an awesome day. We get PSA test when we're going for our annual physical. We also, the doctor usually will ask, I know he asked me, do I want a rectal exam for to test the prostate? Yeah. But those aren't really going to tell us if there's cancers there. No. So what's the best way to find out if there's cancer growing in, in the, if you have cancer, prostate cancer? Okay. So there's a lot of factors here. This is where a lot of my interest is held because... There's the DRE, which is a prostate exam, a digital rectal exam, right? And a DRE is not very uh, sensitive. So just because you don't feel a nodule does not mean that there's no prostate cancer. 
But if you do feel a nodule, it's very specific to that. So it could possibly be a, uh, a prostate cancer. Then you check PSA. But just, you know, this is typically, uh, I would hope that most physicians are not making this mistake, but you don't want to check your PSA after you do the uh, prostate exam because the act of just doing a prostate exam can increase your PSA. So a lot of men will get a, will get a prostate exam and then go get their blood work the day after and their PSA is elevated. Well, yes, of course it's elevated. You know, I just had a prostate exam. Obviously that's, that's, that's what it's, that's what it'll do. So you have to monitor the, the PSA. Now, the United States Protective Task Force really says we shouldn't be testing for PSA uh, in men older than, I think it's uh, 65 or 70. But because they say, well, it doesn't really matter. And they gave it, they gave it a grade C of testing men at the age of uh, between 50 and 65. Why? Because there's a lot of false positives. So it may come back high. And you go ahead and try to treat this guy for prostate cancer or do a biopsy, but in the end, there really is no cancer there. So that you put this guy, I don't know if you've ever had a prostate biopsy. I'm, I have not, but it's not, it's not interesting. It's not fun. I mean, no, <laughs> not, I many, not many guys want to have their I wouldn't prostate. imagine so. Yeah, you don't want to have your prostate <laughs> punctured 12 times and, you know, having uh, bleeding. I will say, though, that a lot of the urologists that I've seen um, that I work with, they're exceptional at what they do, especially the urologists at NYU. They are top-notch. Um, and most patients, I would say, will tell me, you know, that was a great experience. I really had no pain. Um, side effects lasted a day, and then I was good, which is great. That's not, that's not fun to do. So PSA is one thing, but you have, to, you have to put into context. You also need to check it with the DRE. You need to check the man's age. You need to see if they have a family history. Um, you have to see if they have any of the symptoms. Like, if they are, are they having difficulty? Are they having difficulty urinating? Are they having some hesitancy? You want to check those things as well. Then you can do uh, an ultrasound, or you can also do a, a an MRI. And then, so the, the list is extensive. And then you can also do something called the 4K score. The 4K score checks four different types of PSAs and creates a algorithm. So it creates a score as to what your risk of having an aggressive prostate cancer might be. That's what's being used a lot more now, but it's not, it's not a screening tool. It's not saying you should do this. That's usually what's used after they start seeing a trend in the PSA going up. So then there's things like PSA velocity and then PSA density. So how much compared to the prostate gland, how much of the, so the PSA density is PSA divided by the, pro, the volume of the prostate and, um, you know, if that's high, then you try to, then you have to be more concerned. Or if, uh, you look at the PSA velocity, if it's doubling very frequently, then you have to look at that and say, okay, maybe we need to dig a little bit deeper. As you can see, it's not straightforward. It's not. And that's probably the reason, is that maybe the main reason that this is so hard to detect? Yes. And that's exactly right. But I also think that, um, you know, a lot of men are, being either overdiagnosed or not being treated properly. Okay. And yes, it is very hard to detect because you can get a PSA. I mean, I've had I've had patients who had prostate cancer where PSA was normal. Wow. It just, I mean, it was it was. I mean, it was a little bit elevated, but it wasn't uh, above a four. It wasn't even above a three. They were like, okay, it's around this area. And there are there are some prostate cancers that are low PSA. It really depends. So it's really hard to kind of, it's not, there is no perfect test right now. The best thing that we have is MRI guided uh, prostate biopsies, but an MRI is expensive and a biopsy is uncomfortable, but that's really what we have. So what I do is I take everything into consideration. That's why, you know, um, I have to be very holistic in what I am and how I approach people because most men don't die from prostate cancer. They die from heart disease. So, you know, if I have a 75 year old man and his PSA is elevated and he has a Gleason 7 prostate cancer, you know, and his urologist may want to take out his prostate, you have to consider like, what is his 10 year survival rate? And then also, which I really like is uh, genetic testing on the prostate tissue. 
there's something called Prolaris, an oncotype, which is you can actually, what you can do is you take the prostate, when they do a prostate biopsy, they test that tissue and they test, they test the genetic uh, components of that tissue. And then they can uh, calculate what is their survival rate. Is this a very aggressive cancer or not? Whether you need to be on active surveillance, so you could just leave it alone, or you actually have to have a prostate, uh, a prostate surgery, prostate removal. There's so many things, Tom, and it's just like, yeah, you ha- you have to specialize in this. You have to. You have to. There's just no way that the average general practitioner could just go ahead and say, yeah, I know all about this. Like, look, I just spent I don't know five minutes, and that's not even touching the tip. Right. Well, then you have that whole aspect of getting the health insurance or health insurance companies to pay for this testing based on a PSA level. Right. Right. Exactly right. So, you know, getting an MRI, that might be hard to get covered if your PSA really isn't too high. Or getting your um, you know, getting a prostate biopsy. Oftentimes that's that's pretty easy to get, but it you have to really be careful and um make sure that and also, you want to make sure that you know these guys are not just doing the biopsy just to do the biopsy. Right. You really need an informed. I mean, PSA. What are PSA ranges for? You know, this is another problem: is that normal ranges are based on a huge population of people. What normal and what is optimal? Yeah. So I like to see prostate. Uh, so I mean, it, that's a hard question to answer because normal is considered below four. Okay. All right. But it depends how old you are. If you're an older man and you have a big prostate, you might be making more PSA, but it may not be cancerous. It just might be that you have more prostate tissue, more PSA. So that could be elevated. I like anything above a four is alarming. Anything above, like, but, but so anything above a four really would warrant further workup. Um, anything from a three to a four, I'm a little bit suspicious. But if it's a 3.2 and it's been 3.2 for seven years, it's probably not going to be very uh, malignant. You know, I have, I, have, I have prostate cancer patients whose PSAs are dropping. Now, that doesn't mean that I'm curing or he, the prostate cancer is going away. But it means something is that it could either mean two things, that the prostate cancer is getting better and it's actually not spreading. Or it could just mean that that test didn't show a high PSA and the prostate cancer is the same. Really, in the end, you have to treat it on a person by person basis. Okay. Let's go into a little bit of how we as men can keep our prostate healthy. Okay. You have a few days? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, uh, the diet, di- diet's first. I mean, diet first, diet always first. But right. so, there's a lot of controversy with prostate cancer and having a healthy prostate. Now the trending is veganism, uh, vegetarian diets. Then there's paleo and keto, which are also very trendy. The research shows that typically the Mediterranean diet in terms of having a healthy prostate is the way to go. It has the most research. And a Mediterranean diet is basically a diet high in poly and monounsaturated fats, so olive oil, nuts, seeds, uh, plant-based oils, fish oils, so from salmon, sardines, mackerel, herring, uh, black cod, have higher levels of of omegas, whole grains. So um, I'm not a fan of wheat. I don't think wheat is beneficial. I think that the gluten in the wheat can be uh, pro-inflammatory. So I tell people to try to stay away from the wheat, but uh, brown rice, quinoa, and then also legumes, beans. So uh, lentils are great. Um, edamame beans and actually soybeans, actual soybeans might be productive, but it's very hard to find non-GMO, clean sourced soybeans. So that's how you keep the... the oh, and then I would say, um, you know, not overdoing it on the meats. There's no evidence showing that meat causes prostate cancer, but there's very little evidence showing that meat is protective. So what I say is like, okay, look, this may not be causing your problem, um, but it certainly isn't helping you. So just limit it. And then if you are going to have meat, you want it to have 
And when I say meat, I mean red meat. It should be grass-fed, organic, uh, not fed any junk. I like lamb. Lamb is very uh, easy to find, and it usually is grass-fed. Um, and then bison as well. So those are two meats. But most of the time, uh, to really where it goes on, it's a plant-based diet with fish that can be included in there, limited on the dairy, because there is some research showing that uh, dairy consumption increases something called IGF. IGF is insulin growth factor, and that can feed prostate cancer cells. So that is one thing that I tell people, you know, easy on, easy on the dairy, easy on the meat, fish, plant-based type of diet. Then there's exercise. You have to move. I mean, bottom line, you have to move. You know, evolutionarily, we didn't sit down eight to 10 hours a day on a chair watching these other animals run by. No, we were working and moving around and lifting logs and rocks and things like that. And, um, and then also we weren't, you know, that was just us. And then we were, we were resting in shelter most of the time. But now we're sitting nine to 10 hours a day maybe walking to our car. I mean, I'm in Manhattan a lot, so I'm walking often. And then you're going home to cook, sit down and eat, and then sit down and watch TV. That's a lot of sitting. Right. A so lot you have of to sitting. move. You have to move. Yeah. And the statistics show about three to four hours of intense uh, exercise a week is what's needed. So that, that could be, you know, 30 minutes a day to up to four hours or, uh, or just three to four days, an hour each. That's that's what you need to do. Sleep is important. I mean, these are like no brainer type of things. So I could tell you like, you need to eat well, you need to sleep well, you need to exercise. But the thing is, is what is the dose? Like, what is the dose of exercise? What is the dose of the salmon? What is the dose of the sleep? And the studies show, you know, what I just told you about the, um, the food sleep, uh, you need seven to eight hours. You just need it. Um, six, you could probably get away with, but anything less than six to seven hours, you're, you're asking for trouble. Those are the things you can do to prevent prostate, uh, for, for prostate health. Then we talk about, um, nutrients, right? Zinc is a, an essential nutrient for prostate health. Oh, I would also say I like selenium. I do like, but selenium from food. So Brazil nuts are, are a high source of selenium. Certain meats are a high source of selenium, but also yeast so nutritional yeast that has high levels of selenium in there and actually can be protective so uh zinc which also can be found in pumpkin seeds selenium found in brazil nuts and yeast and then you have beta cytosterol which is found in like saw palmetto and uh, nettle root and pumpkin seeds so these are a lot of things that you can start taking now now you know if you're a 30 year old guy should you really start taking all of these supplements i don't know but there are a few that you really should be taking. Fish oil, absolutely. You need to take fish oil because that's being protective. Uh, vitamin D, vitamin D on its own, that's actually one of the first papers that I published on vitamin D and, and in large prostate. And they found that actually about five to 6,000 units of vitamin D a day can prevent enlarged prostate and actually slow the, slow the uh, growth of an enlarged prostate. Turmeric, curcumin is an excellent uh, supplement to be taking. I mean, there isn't anything that turmeric doesn't do, right? So those are a few things that I would say, well, that's, those are the absolute necessities. Yeah, I rank turmeric in my, it was one of the best anti-inflammatories around. It really I, is. I, it's amazing. It really is. And zinc, I, my, you know, zinc, vitamin D, a lot of people don't understand the whole vitamin D process. <sighs> but there's no way that we as humans get enough sun to make enough vitamin D. Right. Unless you lay naked outside for three or four hours a day, it's just not going to happen. And I live in New York, so yeah. it's it's dark at four o'clock. I mean, and you're not right. getting sun. Well, to your point, most of us sit behind this computer screen all day, exactly for eight hours a day. We're not getting anywhere near the amount of sun we need. So no, it's D, just not happening. A good quality D is definitely in the books. Absolutely. Is there anything you want to add to this? Before we close out, so I do want to talk a little bit about the necessity for research. Okay. And now there are a lot of urologists who are more open to um, integrative medicine, into functional medicine, more so than ever. We, but, but it's absolutely necessary. It's about time. Yeah. And, but you know what? Look, 
I don't blame them, right? Because if I didn't study something, if I didn't look at the research, then it, to me, it does not exist, right? It's like, I don't know that, you know, if I was living in, um, for example, this is a great example. Think of like Alfa Romeo, right? It recently just came to America. But prior to that, you ask most Americans, like, I have no idea what that is. It does not exist, right? So, but now that it's in America, that now it exists. So now we're bringing more attention to it. So I want people to bring more attention to this area. And that's one of my goals is to start conducting, uh, that's what we're doing, is we're conducting research to try to bring more attention to this area and say, hey, look, this is what we can do to help improve this function, uh, to help improve the outcomes of these people with, you know, who may have prostate cancer, who may have enlarged prostate, who may have prostatitis. Urologists love me when they have a chronic prostatitis patient who's like, the antibiotics are not working, the anti-inflammatories are not working, the Xanax is not working, the antidepressants are not working. I don't know what to do. And I'm like, bring them here. I can take care of it. So they, they know that and they get it. But um, we need more attention for it. And I want to bring more attention to that in terms of education. So I really think that this should start being a foundation in a lot of uh, national uh, uh, organizations or institutes. You know, I'm honored and I'm eternally grateful to be an adjunct professor at NYU. I teach the master students, um, the dietitians, in uh, complementary and alternative nutritional therapies. And when we go through that course, we kind of parse out like, what is the good stuff that has good evidence and what's the stuff that's, you know, sham. And I think we need more of that. Um, and then also, you know, I use acupuncture as well. And I think, uh, that is a field that is now getting a lot more attention and more practitioners are open to that because, you know, putting a needle in somebody and then seeing a result, that's kind of hard to, you know, ignore. Um, but that's, that's really good for like overactive bladder and large prostate prostate pain, those are all things that are really, um, I think we need to bring more attention to. Uh, and and I, I really hope that, you know, doing this with you and a lot of your listeners, they start becoming more aware because, you know, you need people who are passionate about this and people who are obsessed with this kind of stuff. And, you know, that's, that's where I'm at right now. I'm passionate and obsessed about this stuff. That's, that's very cool because I'm, obs- I'm obsessed with studying this stuff. Like well, kind of like you, I, my coffee table. I don't. I think I turn the TV on maybe one hour a week, and or on the weekend for college football. Yeah. But, but usually it's a book in front of me, reading about this and and men's health and whatever thyroids, thyroid or hormones, all of it, because it, it's important. It's super important, and not enough people are talking about it. And also with testosterone, people are just going to you know get a shot of testosterone right. and saying, "Yeah, yeah, I'm just going to take testosterone because my testosterone is low." Well, my question is, is why? Not exactly. why are you taking it, but why is it low? Right. And then why are you taking it? Right. And then it just and, and the sad part about testosterone, not to go too far down this rabbit hole, but is younger younger men are starting it at 30 and even yeah. in high school. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and it's, that's scary because it, once you, you both, we both know that once you start taking testosterone as a supplement and mm-hmm. injecting it into your body, your natural hormones are going to stop, sh- shut down the testosterone production. Absolutely. Absolutely. Right. And that's what happens. And then you lead to infertility. And then when they stop that testosterone, then they get depressed and then they start getting man boobs. It's a whole slew right. of things that I helped manage, but I could always, I always tell my, my, my male patient, like, you know, I don't tell them this, but I think to myself, like, man, if you only saw me like a month or a few years before, I really could have just prevented this problem. And we need to, we need to bring more attention to that. You know, I, um, I'm sure you saw on my Instagram and on my Facebook, I posted 30 facts for every day of uh, November and for, for Movember. And, um, <laughs> and uh, one of them was, I think, is about 2% of high school boys take testosterone or take steroids. I saw that. That's, that's a lot. That's, that's a lot. We should not be, that should be, you know, paid attention to because now you're impacting their hormonal product and they're not even, they're not even developed yet. So it's just, and I get it. I know, because you want to look like you know Hussein Bolt, and you want to look like 
Arnold and, and all of these other, you know, fitness athletes. I get it, but it's really, it should not be the case. Right. Right. Exactly. I'm glad you said that. And actually, I love following you on Instagram. Your Instagram posts are spot on. And I, I'm going to put that, I'm going to put your Instagram in the show notes and your Facebook in the show notes, your Twitter in the f- show notes and your website in the show notes. But thank you. Yeah. I mean, it, it, it's sad. It's very sad. And, you know, and to your point about, you know, it starts with a diet. It does. And processed foods are, are killing America. And I, I, I just picked up a, Chris Kresser's book on unconventional medicine. It's, it's crazy scary. Yeah. And, you know, we just have to bring more attention to it. It's it, coming. It'll get there. It's it'll coming. get there. But the medical system is not there yet. There's still, you know, 15 minutes, you're in and out. And it's impossible for me to do that. Now, before I go, I, I, I ask this of all my guests. I, we all live a busy schedule, but we also take, I take my time to chill out and, and do things just to bring my serotonin level or, or my, not my serotonin, but get my back into the parasympathetic mode. Uh-huh. If you could listen to one album or one artist for an hour, who would you listen to? Alicia Keys. Ah, nice. I love her. Yeah. Actually, funny story. Uh, when she first came out with that album, her first album, which uh, the first song was, I think it was, uh, I think it's called Songs in a Mirror, but it was um, the, the, the major single was Fallen. She actually walked into my, uh, my aunt's pastry shop. Like she was like not famous yet, but my family, like, oh my God. You know, because I think of a lot of her family's from New York uh, in the Westchester area. And uh, my father took a picture with her and I've just been like, I'm infatuated with her. I think she's a phenomenal artist. I think she's very honest, very open. And her voice is just like, yeah, oh my God. Amazing. So I listened to her all throughout undergrad on the subways. I still listen to her now. So yes, it's Alicia. Keys. Okay. And I also wanted to say, I love your hundred days of gratitude. Oh yes. <laughs> About that. Yeah. I think I'm on day 87, 88 <laughs> to, uh, right now. I don't know where I'm at. Matter of fact, I, every morning I write down three things I'm grateful for. And then at night I write three things I'm grateful for. That's awesome. And you were on my list today. So I yes. just want to let you know that. Thank you for yes. taking the time to visit with me. I appreciate all you do for the, this, our, the health of our country and, and thank you for coming on board today. Yeah, my pleasure. And uh, if you guys have any questions or if any of your listeners have questions, please do not hesitate to reach out. I actually, I, I answer and I do like yeah, to, you do. I do like to uh, interact. Okay. Thank you very much. My pleasure. Thank you for joining in today with the Rebel Health Coach, Tom Underwood. And be sure to subscribe to the show so you can catch all the episodes. With desire and commitment, you can implement a lifestyle of wellness and fitness. For the support, encouragement, and tools you need to be successful, visit TomUnderwood.net.